Hello there and welcome back to a new session from the Divine Healing Teaching Series. We are still in Chapter 7 entitled The Main Law of the Kingdom and we're talking here about how does the kingdom function. And we began talking about the parable of the sower from Mark chapter 4 verses 1 to 20 and we started talking about uh, those four types of grounds and we left off on the thorny ground where we were talking about worry and about the root Greek word for worry was merizo, which meant to divide. We are talking about that conflict, uh, inside conflict between what the word of God says and what our experiences say. And then we talked about that God doesn't need a lot of people and crowds of people to beg him to do something on earth. But it takes only two people of faith to agree on anything on the earth and it shall be done for them. There's no need of crowds or begging for long times. And most of the, most of the times we're trying to ask God for something that he has already given us. Amen. And today we continue to we continue to talk about worry and about this thorny ground. And if you have your Bibles ready, let's begin by reading a passage from James chapter 5 verses 16 to 18. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, but you are welcome to use any English translation that you have available. And it says this, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Amen? Now, what was Elijah's earnest prayer from this passage? Of course, it was that time when he went up on the mountain and he began praying for seven times for rain to come. And then at a certain point, he sends his servant to see if rain has come. And the servant comes back and he said that he saw a, a small cloud like the palm of his hand. And then Elijah continues to pray. And that's what, that was Elijah's earnest prayer, right? Wrong. That wasn't his earnest prayer. And now I see if you're paying attention or not. Let's see what the text says. It says that he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. So his earnest prayer was at the moment when he said that it would not rain. The second prayer, if you look in verse 18 of James chapter 5, he says, he, and he prayed again. So the second prayer for rain to come, where the Bible says that he prayed seven times, it, the Bible says here in James that he just prayed, not earnestly. Now let's go to 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, and see Elijah's earnest prayer when he prayed for rain, for, uh, not to rain. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. What did Elijah do here? Did he pray? No, he just gave a word of command full of faith. And still the Bible says in James that he prayed earnestly. So his earnest prayer was just a word of command. It would not rain. Let's read it again. As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. That was his earnest prayer. Now let's see the second prayer where the Bible says he prayed again. In 1 Kings chapter 18 verses 41 to 45. Then Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. See, he's, he's full of faith. He is again declaring, but we'll see that in his heart, he doesn't have the same faith. So he said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. That's after three years and six months where, when it was not, it didn't rain at all. Now uh, the time came for, for rain to come. Verse 42. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, to the mountain, then he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. 
And seven times he said, go again. Then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hands, hand rising out of the sea. So he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. See here, it, it, it required seven times. We see Elijah going up on the mountain and take, taking this posture, putting, putting his face between his knees. He was kneeled down and he was, he was praying for rain to come. And after seven times, he sends his servant to see. And we think that this is his earnest prayer. But this was, a, a, this was mostly a, faith, a, a prayer in unbelief. Because it took seven times for him to build himself up in, in faith into what the word of God said. It was easier for him to declare the negative, to say that the rain would not come. It was full of faith because that's how we are people. We have a tendency to justice, to revenge. And he really believed and he was convinced. But the second time when the word of God said for rain to come... It took seven times. He went up on the mountain. He crouched and he prayed seven times to build himself up. And then we see a small, small cloud. And that's the same thing with healing. Many times we pray and we command and we don't see anything. You see, Elijah didn't stop. He prayed and prayed and commanded until he saw a small cloud coming and then rain came. And sometimes we we might be in the same position when we minister healing to someone. It might take multiple times of command, uh, mostly to build ourselves in faith. It's not for God to intervene. God has already healed us. Healing is in place. It's just a matter of us taking that healing and delivering it, ministering to others or to ourselves. So earnest, an earnest prayer is not a, a long prayer of intercession of days and months and weeks for God to intervene. There are two mistakes here. An earnest prayer is a short command prayer of faith, and it's it's not it's not begging God to do something, but it's it's speaking what God has already said. So it's not the, the problem is not on God's side, but it's on our side. So I wanted to to pinpoint this because this is very important. Now, nowhere in the Bible says that if you pray enough, you will get what you want. And I'll say it again, nowhere in the Bible says that if you pray enough or long, you will get what you want. But it says that if you believe in your heart and not doubt, whatever you ask, you will receive. And we see that in Mark 11, chapter chapter 11, verse 24. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And you might say, oh, but that's hard to believe. It takes a lot of time to believe. Yes, it takes a lot of time. And you need to meditate day and night to always be prepared. You have to put the word of God in abundance in your heart. Because all life is spiritual. All life, that everything that happens to you, everything around you is spiritual. The root, the source of it is spiritual. That's why the Bible says to keep our hearts with all diligence because out of it come the issues of life. Your world, your reality is spiritual. It was created in the spiritual realm. And whatever you are today and where you are today is what you believed and spoke yesterday. So if you want your reality and your world, your life to change into something else, you need to start believing something else and speak something else so that your future will look different. Because all life is spiritual and it matters what you believe, what you put in your heart, what you speak out. It matters. It creates realities. Let's see Luke chapter 10 verses 38 to 42. We're still talking about worry in the context of the thorny ground says this, Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. That's Jesus coming to Martha's house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. 
And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried. Again, the word marimna, that the Greek word marimna. You are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. Now let's he see here in, the, in this passage. Martha was not distracted, distracted with adultery or something immoral, but she was distracted with something good, with serving, with something noble. And the Lord tells her, Martha... You are worried, Marimna, you are worried for so many things, but only one thing is needed, to listen to the word of God, what Mary was doing. It seems like she was wasting time, but she was doing the most important thing, Satan's top priority, which should be our top priority, to put the word of God in us. Even serving can become a distraction to listening to the word because we find our satisfaction in that and we do it more and more thinking that we will be rewarded by God and we might be rewarded. But the most important thing beyond serving, beyond ministry, is to put the word of God in you. And I'm saying that even to ministers which are helpers to the church, pastors, teachers, apostles, prophets, uh, evangelists. Putting the word of God in us is beyond that ministry. So if you focus too much on the ministry and uh, neglect the word, that's not good. And, uh, and we need to put the word of God in us so that faith will be built up in us and we will be always prepared. So it's not like a formula where you do this, this and this and then God answers. It's completely opposite. God has already did everything that he wanted to do and he put it in his word. He has already healed us. He has already given us the victory. He has already given us eternal life, His Holy Spirit, the Word. Now the responsibility is on our end to make that Word work and to, uh, to see the promises coming to pass. And it takes, uh, it takes a little bit of time because you need to put day and night the Word of God in you so that you would believe it easy and then speak it out as Elijah spoke in an earnest prayer and then things happen. So the problem is not on God's side, but it's on our side. And it's depending, you can, you can have things happening in your life and a supernatural life, depending on how much you want it, how much time you devote to the word of God, to prayer, to worship. In the same proportion, you will see uh, supernatural things happening in your life. So with this type of ground, the thorny ground, that powerful word of God, which is settled and fixed, in the heavens becomes unfruitful on earth is that god's plan no jesus made it very clear the word of god which was able to heal some people will become unfruitful in this person's life with a thorny ground where you allow the cares of this world the desires for other things the deceitfulness of riches to come into your heart stay long enough and choke the word of faith in your heart so the word becomes unfruitful. Zero promises come to pass in your life. And then you wonder why. You wonder why you don't get answers to prayer and you come, with all, you come up with all these ideas. We need to pray more. We need to add more people to intercede, to convince God. We don't need to convince God of anything. We need to convince ourselves that what he said is true and it, it will happen and it will come to pass. Do you see the difference? This will save you of a lot of frustration. Because you'll not go and worship and pray to God expecting something to happen. You will go and thank Him, build yourself up in, in, fa in faith, worship Him, being grateful for what He has done. If you have to ask something, ask and then thank Him and stay in faith. It's a different approach, but you are always full of joy that you are on your way to victory. That you are you're building yourself and you'll start seeing more and more things happening in your life. That the Word of God says about you. The question is, whose fault it is, as I said? Is that God's fault that the word becomes unfruitful in our lives on this earth? Did God change his mind in the meantime? Did God just decide to do something else because he has a special plan for you or for me? You know, even though I promised that I would take this problem away from you, I will let you go through it because I have something special for you. It's going to make you a better person. Is God like that? Does God say this kind of thing? That he wants to do us, to make a, out of us a better person by putting us to go through things? No, it's not, it's not like that. 
We always have all kinds of logic and reasonings. And I, have, I hear people saying all the time, people that maybe have gone through difficult times, they are saying something like this. Oh, now I look back and I understand what God was doing. God was teaching me that over there and that over there. Uh, now, I just can't wait to get to heaven and see these people trying to explain to God what he was doing. It's funny, but it's not funny. Because we imagine what God might have wanted to teach us, what God might have wanted to do in our lives through some sickness or through some problems that we think he, he brought in our lives. He is not the one bringing problems into our lives. The devil is, people are, and we ourselves sometimes. How can God say that his word is going to come to pass and then have Jesus come and say that the word will become unfruitful? It seems like they contradict each other. It says that God, on one hand, God says that his word will always come to pass and it will not become void. It will not return void. But on the other hand, Jesus says in this parable that sometimes the word becomes unfruitful. How do we explain that? How do we reconcile that? How can they both be true in the same time? And they are. The word will always accomplish what was sent for, but maybe not in your life or in my life, unless we decide to receive it and hang on to it tighter than anything anybody ever says, tighter than any thoughts that come to your mind, any reasoning or logic. You just say no to them and stand on the word of God. And when the dust settles and the smoke goes away, there will be just me and the word still standing. That's the attitude that we need to have to see the word of God becoming fruitful in our lives. Amen? This is so powerful. Psalm 91 verse 7 says this, A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. It doesn't matter how many people die around you. It shall not come near you if you stand on the word, on what God has said. That's confidence in the word. When the psalmist talks about the thousands falling at his side, he's not talking about the enemy, but about his comrades, about his team. Who are our comrades today? Who are our friends? Maybe other Christians. So even if other Christians fall at your side and 10,000 at, right, at your right side, it will not come near you if you stay on the word. Does God show favoritisms? No. As long as you stay on the word, the anointing of God will protect you. That's why I'm saying that so many Christians today, they experience failure. Why? Because, and we look at them and say, how could that Christian experience this and that? Because we don't know how much they put the word of God in them. We don't know what they believe. We don't know what they spoke. But if you stay on the word of God, if you believe the word of God, if you speak the word of God, it shall not come near you. It doesn't matter if other Christians, other born again believers fall at your side and 10,000 at your, side, at your uh, right side. It will not come near you. That's what the word of God says. Can you believe that? That the word of God is so powerful. In this book, what God has spoken about us, if we take it and believe it and apply it to our lives, it will save us. That's salvation. We are saved from the, from the things of this world while we are on earth. And then we are saved from hell. But here, salvation means that you live by the, a different law, by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, Romans tells us. What is that law? That law of the spirit of life makes you immune to sickness, to poverty, to failure, to fear, to depression, to all this stuff, all from darkness. That's how powerful the word of God is. And that's why it's so important to put the word of God in us so that it will, it will manifest into salvation into our lives on, this, on, on our daily lives. And here you have this big army of Saul, if we go back to the Old Testament, shaking before Goliath and the Philistines army. And this little boy comes saying, guys, that guy doesn't even have a covenant with God. Come on, what's up with you? Give me some rocks. When you know God, when you know what he said and believe it, you will do things that nobody else can do. That was David's faith. That's how he defeated Goliath. 
He put his faith on the covenant that he had with God, on what God has said about him and them. And what was the relationship between them? You see, such a big army of Saul, the whole army was shaking in front of Goliath, was shaking in fear. You can, you can consider that army as other Christians in our days. So many Christians are shaking in, in, in front of the devil and in front of sickness, in front of death. But there was this little boy and said, come on guys, you know what the word of God says. This guy doesn't even have a covenant with God. Give me some rocks and I'll defeat him. That's how we should, uh, should be. That's how we should take the word of God and believe it. Not shake in fear when cancer or HIV or anything comes on you. Just command it in the name of Jesus to go. This tumor, I, dis I, I destroy you by the power of the word of God. You must live. You are illegal in my body. That's how we should be as Christians, as born again believers. Amen. Now let's move on and talk about the good ground. That's the sixth uh, subsection in this big chapter. And let's read again uh, Mark chapter 4 verse 20, which describes this type of ground. And it says this. But these are the ones sown on good ground, those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit. Some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. So we finally get to the good ground, and we see that even the good ground produces fruits in levels, in stages. Thirty percent, sixty percent, and even a hundred percent, a hundredfold. And notice that it doesn't say that these are the ones that got the good word. No. These are the ones that got the same word of God, but had a good ground, had good hearts. That's the difference. It's not a different word, but a different heart. Is Jesus partial here when he talks about stages? Giving 30% to some, 60% to others, and 100% only to a select few. Is, is Jesus partial? Is the responsibility on Jesus' side? He decides to whom to give 30% and then 60% and then 100%? No. He says that there are different levels. And the levels are depending on us, on our hearts, on how much we receive the word. It's, it does not depend on God or on Jesus. This percentage of producing fruits does not depend on God. It depends on us. Now, even for many of the people that are on good ground, only 30% of the things that God has said or sown will come to pass. Can you imagine that? Only 30% from the whole Bible, from everything that God has said. And these are the people of faith, like Joshua or Caleb. Now, did God decide for these people that he didn't want the other 70% of things to come to pass? Did God decide to not have 70% come to pass, but only 30%? No. It got stolen or choked. So 70% that is unfruitful in our lives, it got stolen or choked. Amen? You know, these people that have 30% of fruit, they are thrilled about this 30%. If 30% of our prayers ca are coming to pass, that's pretty good by Christian standards, right? But that says that 70% is not being fruitful and is not getting answers. 70% of your Christian walk is not bearing fruit. And that's not good. It's good, but it's not still very good. It's better than most, but still not good. 30%. Jesus mentioned the hundredfold on purpose, the 100%. Because he wants us to know that it's possible to have 100% of fruit, of things coming to pass into our lives. How do we know it's possible? Because there was a human being who walked on earth and believed everything God said and allowed everything his God said to come to pass in his life. That was Jesus and he walked by faith like all of us. He didn't walk with special anointings. He walked by faith. Maybe it's hard for us to believe that, but he had to believe like we have to believe. Everything that Jesus did was by faith. When you have a mountain in front of you not moving, have you taken the stance that Jesus took, his attitude towards things that, were, that came in his path? I will not say anything except what my father said. That's what, that was Jesus' attitude. I will not say anything except what my father said. 
Or you're saying, well, it seems like in this situation, if God wanted to move, it would have moved. That's how we talk. If God wanted to move, then it would have moved. And then we, we put our responsibility down. We are not responsible. God is responsible. And, and maybe you know that famous song, Mighty to Save, which says in its chorus that God can move the mountains. God can move the mountains. You know, that's true. God can move the mountains. But in the New Testament, God is no longer in the business of moving your mountains. You are to move your mountains and speak to them. That's what the Bible, the Bible tells us. God will not come and move your mountain. Or if he does, he does it out of mercy because he knows you don't know more or you don't, you don't know enough. And he might save you from time to time. But that's not how things work. That's not how the, he expects us to walk by faith. He says, speak to the mountains. He said to us, he told us, speak to your mountains and move them away. Amen. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12 says this. That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Through faith and patience inherit the promises. There's an element of faith and speaking and commanding, but there's also an element of patience in the process of inheriting the promises. And that was a thing that I missed for years. It's not just faith, that it's also patience. We need to be patient and put the word of God in us and grow, and grow our minds so that we can release that faith that is in our spirit. It's the same way with a farmer who sows the seeds and then he needs patience until he sees the fruits come up, coming up. A farmer puts the seeds and then he waits. That's how we do with the word of God. Things will not happen uh, overnight. You heard the word and then it will, it will immediately happen. That seed of the word that got into your heart needs time to grow, to become strong. And then when you speak, things happen. And let me give you a little tip. You must watch out for people who are making excuses for why the promises of God are not coming to pass. You have to be very careful. Actually, what usually happens with those people with those people is that they have a conflict inside of them. Those people that make excuses for why the promises of God are not happening today, why miracles are not happening today. The Holy Spirit nags them to believe what God said, but because it didn't work so many times, they feel the need to justify themselves out loud constantly. And you will notice that. People that don't believe God, that what the, what the Word of God says for today, they will need to justify themselves out loud constantly. And we need to be careful of those people, to not listen to them. And let me tell you how, how you can know when you're actually hearing the Word and not something else. And I said this before in other sessions. Let's see what Romans 10, 17, 17 tells us. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. What does the Bible say here? The Bible says that faith comes by hearing, and the hearing by the word of God. If you come in and someone is preaching the word, and you walk out believing the word more, then you heard the word, because faith came in. But if you walk out doubting whether or not God's promises will come to pass in your life more than when you walked in, in into church or in some other conference, I don't care how many scriptures were read. I don't care how many Greek words were passed or parsed. You didn't hear God's word because faith didn't come in. When you hear God's word, you believe it more. You're bold, you're excited, you're full of joy, you're full of peace and hope. That's what the word of God does to us. So Jesus is helping us through this parable. He's pointing out all those things that take away our confidence and boldness in the word. If you could see God's plan for your life, it doesn't matter how many times you messed up or what your background is or what your socio socioeconomic status is. It doesn't make any difference. You would just pass out if you would see the plan that God has for you and for me in this life, on this earth. You wouldn't be able to handle this plan. And you say, could that be me? 
Yes, of course, but it's going to take you standing on the promises of God, on His Word. Everything you're going to do great for God is going to be by faith. It's not just going to happen to you. You will make it happen and you will make that happen by faith. It will not just happen to you. Don't just wait there and, oh, God has to do this. God will do it one day. One day God will do this for me. No. You need to grow in faith and take the word in you and then make things happen. Amen. Let's read one more passage from Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, which talks about the word of God. It says this, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Have you noticed something here interesting? This book will not depart from your mouth, not from your mind. If you want to make your way prosperous and if you want to have good success. There is a promised land for us here on earth, a Canaan. It belongs to us. It's ours. But we have to get it by faith. There's a promised land of healing, of continuous healing, continuous health here on earth. This is our promised land, but we need to take it by faith. Only Joshua and Caleb entered into the promised land while the unbelieving rest died in the desert. How many millions? Probably around 6 million Jews, 6 million people or more. I don't know the exact number, but there were many. And out of that crowd, only two people entered the promised land. Can you believe that? Joshua and Caleb. God didn't care that so many people died in the desert. He doesn't care. But whatever he said, those two people that chose to believe God's word, they entered the promised land. And that's why the Bible calls the, the way of salvation a, na a narrow, narrow way. Because so few Christians find that narrow way to believe the word of God and enter the promised land of healing, of victory, of uh, blessing, of prosperity here on earth. Before we get into heaven, we make the word work here before we get into the new life. So that's how most Christians are on earth, even though they will not go to hell. They are saved from hell. They will go into the new life after the second coming. They will be with God. But here on earth, they will not enter the promised land. And that's sad because you can benefit and you can, you can enter this promised land where you experience the supernatural life of God here and you become a testimony. You become a wonder for other people. So whatever you do, don't let go of the word. It is a fight of faith, but it's a good fight of the mind. It's a fight, but it's a good fight. And 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12 says this, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Lay hold of eternal life, which is already in you. Lay hold of it. You already have it, but you can use it. Lay hold of it by faith. Find the good fight of faith. And in this fight of faith, we are not boxing God in or forcing Him to do anything because He loves us and He wants us to have what He said in His Word. And He's, he's after the, the 100% as any farmer would be. He wants to see 100% of His Word fulfilled in our lives. And He loves us. And we are not forcing Him. We are not twisting His arms. He has already said what he wants us to have. Amen. So we'll close here chapter 7 about the, the law of the kingdom, which is faith in the word and how the word gets into our heart. How does the word get to fruition? Uh, and that I think that was really important to know that there's a process. There's a time of patience before supernatural things happen in our lives uh, on a regular basis. Now we're, we're moving forward to the last big chapter of, the, of this series, chapter 8, which is entitled, How to Minister Healing to Other People. And, and we'll talk a, a little bit about practical things to do when you minister to the, to the sick. And the first subsection here is speaking and laying of hands. That's the first method of ministering healing to the sick. And let's read the passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, where it says this. 
And since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. So when we have faith and conviction, we speak words of life that bring healing and deliverance. The first method of uh, ministering healing is by speaking words of command, full of faith, full of conviction in the word of God. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says this, For the word of God is living and powerful, or active in other translations, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And then John 6 verse 63 says this, It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. What are these passages saying? Our words are full of power when they are based on the word of God. They are full of quantum power, of spiritual power. And they cut darkness and evil spirits. They are full of life when they are based on the word of God. They are based, uh, these are the Rema words. They are wor the, wor the word of God is Logos when it sits on the Bible and is the, the spoken word of God. But when we take that word and believe it and then we speak it out, out of faith, that's Rema. So when we speak the Rema of God full of faith, we cut darkness, we cut sickness. Because those words are full of spirit, they are full of life, full of power. And the only two ways used by Jesus to heal were one, word of command calling into existence by speaking and commanding. And the second way was laying of hands. And he told us the same ways, to lay our hands over sick people and they recover, to command and speak and to heal the sick. So when we pray for a sick person, we minister from our spirit to the person, to the sick person's spirit, and then it comes out in the flesh, the healing. So we minister from spirit to spirit because the Bible says in John 7, 38, Jesus said that from our belly will flow rivers of living water. From our innermost being, from our heart, will flow rivers of living water, will flow rivers of life. So we minister from spirit to spirit and then from the spirit to flesh. And it is not from flesh to flesh, but from our spirit to the person's spirit. And there's a legal and vital phase in healing. The legal phase in healing is commanding in the name of Jesus and serving the eviction papers, saying the sickness to go. And then the vital part is where we release life into people, into the sick people. We lay our hands or we speak and we release life, the life of God. Because the Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if I'm not mistaken, that the last Adam has become a life-giving spirit. And we are born in Christ who is a life-giving spirit. So we have become also life-giving spirits, spirits that give life to other people. So we minister life. We speak and then we minister life. And we don't necessarily need to touch the affected part, especially if it's an intimate part, intimate part. We can lay our hands anywhere on their body because life will flow in the affected part as well. Life is like a thing. It's flowing through us to them and then it will touch also the affected part. Another thing is that we can also speak and command healing for a person at a distance from different places without actually touching the person. And I'll give an example with Jesus and Roman centurion. The Roman centurion came to Jesus and Jesus just spoke a word. He didn't go in his house. He just spoke the word and the servant was healed right at that moment. In our days, using the internet and Skype, we can talk to a person and even see the person almost instantaneously on the other side of the planet. Isn't that right? Why wouldn't that be true all the more in the spiritual realm if it's possible in the natural? The spiritual world, the quantum one, there in the spirit, there's no distance. You can speak here and have someone healed on the other side of the planet. That's how things work in the spirit. You don't necessarily need to be in a place. You can just speak out and the sick will get healed. Amen? Jesus is our example. He did that and it worked and not only once. When we lay our hands over sick people, the power can be released also according to the intention of our mind without saying anything. 
Yeah, we need to say, but sometimes we can even heal without saying anything. And actually, Mark 16 says that we will only lay hands over the sick without even saying anything. It doesn't mention anything about saying something and they will recover. But when we lay our hands, our intention has to be with the hands and what we want to accomplish. We need to put our intention of the mind on what we want to accomplish with our hands. And I'll give an example here. For instance, the woman with the issue of blood. She had been sick for 12 years. That's in Mark chapter 5, verses 25 to 34. If she just touched Jesus like all the other people, nothing would have happened. However, in verse 28, the Bible tells us that she thought that if she just touch, touched Jesus' garments, she would get well. Her intention was to get well. So she touched him intentionally to get well without saying anything. And even without saying anything, she withdrew power from Jesus just by her intention. By not saying anything, she was healed. The same happens when we minister. If we intend to release life and power through our hands, that's what happens. So sometimes if you know a sick person, even without saying anything, you just go and touch them gently and you, you put your intention there that you want them healed and they can get healed. Amen. And there can be also another situation where you have to deal with a mass of people, maybe 500 or 1,000 and more than 1,000, praise the Lord. And in that situation, they might be too many to minister to each one individually. What do you do in that situation? God is big enough to heal 500 people at once or 1,000 without even touching them. Can you believe that? They can all be healed without you touching them. God, that's powerful. As long as you believe what he has said, that word has the power to, to heal the masses. T.L. Osborne faced this issue once and he prayed only one prayer. Then he reached out his hand and commanded healing over the whole crowd. And we can do the same. And people can get healed. Amen. So the first method of ministering healing is by saying words of command and by laying your hands. The second way to minister healing is by faith and perseverance. Let's read Mark chapter 8 verse 22 to 25. It says this. Then he came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. First, we can see here that Jesus laid his hands one time to, on this blind man. But the blind man didn't see perfectly the first time. So what did Jesus do? He didn't say something like, this is what you get according to your faith. If your faith is just for this, you will only see partially. He doesn't say that. What did Jesus do? Jesus laid his hands a second time on the blind person. If, now, if he laid his hands twice, we can also lay our hands twice on a sick person. We shouldn't be afraid of that. That's not unbelief. But it's patience. It's faith and patience, perseverance to see the sick person healed. Smith Wigglesworth said something that if you prayed 100 times for a sick person, you prayed 99 times in unbelief. That is right, yes and no. He was partially right. And Smith Wigglesworth is not, is not a supreme example. Jesus is. Even though he said that 99 times you prayed in unbelief, that's not true because we see Jesus praying twice for a sick person. And I, you cannot say that Jesus was in unbelief. And I'll, say, I'll explain here why I think that Smith was uh, in one, on one hand right, but on the other hand, he wasn't right. There are two types of prayer. The first type of prayer is when you pray to God for something and ask Him to do something. And these things are things like regarding other people. You, you don't have control. You cannot command over other people, other Christians or other unbelievers because they have free wills. You cannot command something over them. You can only intercede for them to God. You can ask God to intervene or to do something for them. That's why 
in this situation, we have to ask God in prayer. Or things regarding future, where God didn't say anything on black and white uh, in His Word regarding your future, a future job, a future decision that you need to take. In those situations, you need to pray to God and expect Him to answer your prayer. So in this kind of prayer where we ask God for something, as a new creation, we only need to ask Him once and then believe that He listened to us and thank Him. Because He is not deaf. He can hear us the first time. He doesn't need us to pray twice. You pray once and then if you pray a second or third time, you just stay in faith and you just thank Him. You, you don't ask Him again. Because He doesn't need to be begged or implored to do something. He heard you the first time. Now you just need to stand on what you ask, stand in faith, believe that He will do it for you. He listened to you and you continue thanking Him until you see the thing happening. Otherwise, if you ask multiple times for the same thing to God, then you, then you will be in unbelief, as Smith said, because you're assuming that God didn't hear you or He didn't do it. And you believe that, and that's unbelief. And in the Old Testament, when people asked God to do something, they had to ask multiple times and implore God to intervene because they were sinners. They were not sons. And they didn't have any right to ask God to do something on their behalf. That was the situation in the Old Testament. And they were pretty much in the same state as the Syrophoenician woman that came to Jesus. God had to be convinced to intervene. But that is not the case in the New Testament because we are sons and daughters of God. We don't need to implore God to do something for us. He told us to ask Him and he will be more than willing to do so. And he did that in Mark chapter 11 verse 24. He said this, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And then John 16 verse 23 to 24 says this, And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. That's simple. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. So we talked about the first type of prayer where we ask something to God. Now we come and talk about the second type of prayer, the prayer of command, the earnest prayer like we saw with Elijah. He just spoke a word of command, it would not rain. And that was an earnest prayer. This is the second type of of prayer so when we come to laying our hands over sick people or commanding healing we can command multiple times or lay our hands multiple times this is because now we're dealing with the devil not with god we're not asking god something we're asking the devil to live and the devil has ability which he abuses he forces it unto us he doesn't have authority, legal authority, but the devil has ability like any thief. They don't have authority to come into your house, but they still come from time to time. So the, the, the devil has some ability and sometimes he is stubborn. The devil is stubborn. And then is also the amount of power that we are releasing when we command, depending on our level of conviction, level of faith and confidence in the word. And if we release a small amount of power from our spirit, we will have to lay our hands multiple times until the person gets healed completely. That's why we, we lay our hands multiple times. Because maybe the amount of power that we release that works within us at that moment is smaller. During ministering, our level of confidence might grow exponentially and release all at once the amount of life and power needed to cure that sickness and expel the devil completely in one moment. When we command multiple times to, the, to sickness to go, we are adding to the previous commands. That, and that's very important. You're not starting over. You are adding to the previous commands. And you release more power Every time you command, you release more power and more power until the sickness goes. And I'll give here an example. It's a little bit like following a treatment with medicine. When you have an infection and begin taking antibiotics, the infection doesn't go away immediately. 
but with every antibiotic pill that you take, you are closer to complete healing. Isn't that right? It adds to the previous pill. And in the same way is with our prayer. When we lay our hands multiple times or speak multiple times, we don't start over, but we add to what we already ministered to the person. That's very important. And so don't be afraid to, to pray and command multiple times, but do it with faith every time you do it. Now, let's say that any type of healing requires 100 units of faith. It's just an example. But for whatever reason, you're functioning, the, the power works within you at 40%, uh, 40 units of faith. So what happens now? When you lay your hands over the sick, they get a little better. And maybe you've noticed that, you ex you've experienced that. When you minister, you are pouring life into the sick person out of your spirit. John G. Lake said that divine healing is a chemical reaction. It is a mixture of faith and power. And you, as a born-again believer, received all the power you need without measure when you received the Holy Spirit. That's in John 3.34. But that power is released only when faith in the Word is applied to it. That's so interesting. That means the power only works to fulfill those laws, decrees, or words that God has already put in place in the spiritual realm. And only when someone is convinced of those laws or has faith in those words or confidence in those words. So healing power is released out of our innermost being through confidence in the word. Faith acts like a light switch, if you want. The moment you enter a dark room and flip the switch, the power that was already flowing there through the wires goes to the bulb and lights up the room. But we need to flip the switch. Now let's go back to our example. <clears throat> For whatever reason, maybe distraction, tiredness, you're tired, you're vulnerable, you can only release 40 units of power. In that case, I will have to command again and release another 40 units of power, which makes it to 80 units. Then command a third time and the person gets healed completely. When you release life, it goes right into the sick person and drives out sickness. That's what happens when you pray for the sick. And the more you can add to it, the better. It's like putting away sickness, pushing away sickness from the sick person's body. And there might be sick people coming to you and telling you that they were prayed for by the best minister, ministers. What can you do differently? But the truth is that the other ministers might have poured in into you a measure of life. And that person is very close to complete healing. And when you minister, then you fulfill the small portion which was left. And the, then the person gets healed. And in reality, all those ministers work together to get that person healed not just you but you just uh, uh, you just had, there was a little bit more and you you added to that and the person was healed and that's very interesting that that i think that will encourage you to not give up and just continue and pray while you minister to the sick there might be thoughts of doubt coming to your mind mind that's another thing and i i think i mentioned this in uh, other sessions don't think that only because you have those thoughts while you're ministering, which are actually temptation to doubt, that you are already in doubt and everything is lost. It's not lost. And I'll give, another, I'll give again the example of fasting. When you fast, it is impossible to not have temptations to eat. That doesn't mean the fast was already broken. The fast will be broken when you actually eat. And in the same manner, you are in doubt only when your actions begin aligning with those thoughts of doubt, meaning that you will avoid laying your hands or speaking to other people, to, to the sick persons, and you'll stop doing it. That's when you're in unbelief. Until then, those thoughts are just thoughts of the temptations to doubt. And notice also that when we minister to the sick, we don't ask God to heal the person because he has already healed us all. He has already healed us all by Jesus' stripes. But we heal the person in the name of Jesus and by the Holy Spirit. We minister life that was already given to us. He has already given us healing. We just need to work it out on us and to other people by faith. T.L. Osborne said this, 
Never ask God to do what he has already done. This is so true. Never ask God to do what he has already done. And he said, T.L. Oldborn said also, don't ever ask God to do what he told you to do. So there are things he told us to do. And we shouldn't ask him to do what he has already told us to do. Jesus told the disciples and implicitly to us in Matthew 10 verse 8 to go heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. It's our responsibility. Let's read Matthew 10 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So we have received something and we have to give it freely to other people. Jesus never asked God to heal anyone. Go in the Gospels and read all the four Gospels. You will notice that Jesus never asked God to heal anyone. He just either laid his hands on those people or simply said, Be healed or your faith has healed you. He told demons, go. Go and see for yourself. Now I'm getting closer to the end of this session, but I'll say a few more important principles here on the subject of faith and perseverance. In this fight with sickness, we don't cancel the use of medicine. Please remember that. You can be free to take medicine. Medicine will not cancel faith. Genuine faith will work regardless, will always work, regardless that you are taking medicine or not. If you prayed for some time and nothing visible happened, but you know some medical treatment that you can take to fix the sickness, then go ahead and use it without any guilt. Use medicine, use, use treatment. If you prayed and it, nothing happened, just go and use it. Live to fight another day. And I'm saying that especially when it comes to children. Don't exercise your faith on your children. When they are sick, just pray and, and, if, and continue praying even if the ch child is still sick. Don't do that. If you have medicine and the medicine can make him well, give him the medicine they need if prayer didn't work immediately. You live to fight another day and it's better to try it on you first. But even on you, if you, if you pray, nothing happened, just go and take medicine, save yourself and then you, you'll be more prepared next time. Amen? Just be without guilt, be free, be relaxed because they don't cancel. There are two ways, two, two different ways of getting the same results. The doctors and medicine are on our side. They are, they are trying to cure sickness in the same way we do by the word of God. But you know what happens if you, are, if you feel guilty to take medicine? You know the devil will try to put us in a corner to make a commitment not to take medicine. Or he will try to make us refute somehow the law of faith, the fact that you are sick. And, to, and you'll think that in that way you'll make the law of faith work faster. But it will not work. The law of faith will not work necessarily if you cancel medicine. But when it does not work and you don't take medicine you, and your commitment is broken because sooner or later you will take medicine, then it damages or destroys your faith. You, if you did a commitment not to take medicine, you pray, nothing happened, and then you take medicine, that will damage your faith and it will destroy your faith. And that's a trap of the devil. So don't do any, committed, or any commitment. Oh, I'll not take medicine. Oh, I'm healed and I stand strong. I, I don't need medicine. Don't do that because that's a trap. Whenever you're stronger, you're strong enough in faith, you will not even need to say that or take that commitment. You will just pray and you'll be healed. So don't, if you feel weaker in faith, don't take those commitments because when you'll break your commitment, then you will be, a, a, you'll, you'll be damaged in your faith. So quitting medicine does not make faith work better, neither cancels faith. So don't, don't do that. Embrace medicine, embrace doctors and, and up to the limit that they have. The bottom line is that in ministering to the sick, we need to persevere and stand on the word until we see the sickness gone. That's what we need to do. John G. Lake said, Faith is not puffing up, but a settling down. And that's so true. The fight of faith is the fight to rest. In God's word. That's, the, that's what the fight of faith is all about. Whenever we hear a person saying something like, I know God is going to heal me, that is one of the biggest statements of unbelief because going to is always future. 
And 1 Peter 2.24 says that by his stripes we were in the past. We were healed. We were already healed. We are just applying it right now on us. Healing was provided in the gospel. In the same salvation that Jesus brought from sin. And if you had the same doubts about your salvation like you have for healing, you would not get anybody born again. If you need healing or if you want to minister healing to someone, you will have to settle once and for all the fact that healing, as far as God is concerned, is a done deal. Amen? It is an established thing in the spiritual and invisible realm. And be aware that when you start speaking faith, be confident and bold about the word of God. And one last thing that I want to say here, and we'll close here, is for you to be aware that when you start speaking faith, when you start being confident and bold about the word of God, usually to the religious people around you, and I'm referring also to Christians, born again believers, or in your family, or your friends, this kind of talk, it will sound like arrogance and pride, but it's not necessarily so. They will accuse you that you are too proud, you are too confident, you are too arrogant. Speaking faith, as I explained in the previous session, the difference between confidence and, and pride. Speaking faith means having confidence, which can be confused with arrogance. However, it is not confidence in yourself, but it is rather in Jesus and his word. Amen. So today we covered quite a lot. We talked about the thorny ground. We finished that section. Then we talked about the good ground, how to receive the word in the good ground. And we started uh, on the last chapter on how to minister healing. And we talked about words of command and laying your hands. And then we talked about faith and perseverance. And uh, on our next sessions, we will continue with a few more ways of ministering healing, things that we need to consider when we minister healing to people. But until we meet again, I pray that God will bless you as I always do, that God will surround you with his favor, with his wisdom, and that will, will cause you to grow, will grant you to, will grant you to grow and to, to come to the understanding so that you will be able to release more power, more faith, more joy, and to live a supernatural life like he intended us to do. Amen? Amen.